Steve Roberts, president of the West Virginia Chamber of Commerce. Steve, good morning to you, sir. Good morning, all. Good morning. Great to join people of good cheer. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's uh, <laughs> it's a lovely December the 11th uh, here in the Panhandle. Uh, Steve, as we get ready to close out 2024, uh, what kind of year has it been for the West Virginia economy, for the Chamber of Commerce, and for business prospects in our state? You know, our business prospects continue to improve in West Virginia. Um, we've had a good year of recruiting new jobs and new employers into West Virginia. Um, we've looked at the numbers that came out for October, and and we're um, looking uh, – we, we think we will end the year at an all-time high in employment in West Virginia. If we are not at an all-time high, we will certainly be close. We're knocking on the door of an all-time high. Um, there are some – um, there are some things within those numbers we need to talk about. We're doing a good job of creating jobs. We need to do a better job of creating good paying jobs. For instance, and here's an example, we lost jobs. We've, we've actually lost jobs in the manufacturing sector over the last year. So even though we had gains in, um, let's say, tourism and hospitality, those jobs don't pay as much or we had gains in, say, retail trade. But those jobs don't pay as much as jobs in basic industry such as manufacturing, mining, uh, natural gas extraction, utilities, uh, construction. Those, those are where the really bigger wages are paid. And so we need to probably refocus and concentrate our efforts on trying to get more of those better paying jobs into West Virginia. Steve, what uh, manufacturing did we lose? Did a major company close down that I was not aware of? No. Um, what we saw, and it looks to us like it's a reduction in the soft goods manufacturing, so that would chiefly mean the chemical industry. And, um, you know, uh, the chemical manufacturers in West Virginia tell us that they are doing pretty well, that they've had a pretty strong year, but they continue to innovate. And as they innovate, they have fewer employees. And, um, and then I'll come back to, and, you know, I know I'm potentially opening, opening a can of worms, and that's not really my goal here, but I'll come back to West Virginia remains a, a higher cost of doing business state for them, partly because of our tax structure. And um, and they're in a very competitive global environment, and, and they're they're going to move their capital. Their capital is going to go where they can um, maximize value for their employees, customers, and shareholders. And we just we just have to be aware that that's the reality of a global environment. Steve, Bill, yeah, uh, Steve, you mentioned uh, uh, cost of doing business. Uh, our education system, we're ranked 50th or close to 50th. Does that come into play in recruiting a Procter Gamble, Nucor, and the like? You know, those companies are, so we're, we're close to all of those companies. We're in conversation with those companies. And um, by the way, they are, they are five-star companies. They are the kind of companies, name, brand uh, companies that you want to have uh, attracted to your state. And I think they join all of us in being concerned about where the workforce is going to come from, where the next generation of talent is going to come from. We all want to have better schools. We have a situation in West Virginia where in some places our schools are actually pretty good and pretty competitive, and we have many other places in West Virginia where our schools are not very good and not very competitive. Um, we, we have the greatest respect in the world for our school teachers. They work very, very hard. They're not well paid. Um, they, have, um, they, they have real issues with uh, discipline and with parents not being supportive of the work they're trying to do in the classroom. So this is not a school teacher problem. We've got a problem that it's it's harder to educate children who are coming from a background of um, of that is less than ideal. For children who don't have as much at home, maybe they don't have two parents at home to sort of sit on them when they need to be sat on. Um, 
maybe they don't have two parents at home to oversee their homework. Maybe they have people at home who can't help them with their homework because they don't, didn't get very good educations themselves. So the teachers are dealing with all those things. And yes, the companies are concerned, as uh, Bill, as I think all of us are concerned, about how we're going to help our children succeed in their lives as they move forward. But specifically, have you heard of any company that said, well, I'd love to come to West Virginia, but because of the school systems, we're going to go somewhere else? No, I don't have any names of any specific companies that have said we're going to go elsewhere because of the school system. What we have are, are companies that say, you know, we think we can attract and train a workforce in West Virginia. West Virginians have a reputation for being very loyal to their uh, workplace. They change jobs fewer th times than any other workers in the country. So we think we can attract a workforce, but we want to make sure that the public schools are good for our employees and good for our employees' children. And um, the better the public school system, the easier it will be to entice people to transfer to West Virginia when we open the plants and facilities that we have under construction here. So, um, so um, uh, the answer is they want better schools, but I cannot give, I cannot specifically cite somebody who said they wouldn't come here because of our public education system. Nor have I. I have not heard that, but I. Uh, but the schools are invariably a source of a point of discussion. So thanks, Steve. Yes. I suspect yes, that are. there's a, a chicken and egg cycle that's involved with this. The electorate gets the school systems, gets the public services that they demand. So if, if the time comes that a solid education system is, is what's most important to the voters, that will be reflected in, in the funding of schools and, and in the achievement of education. So on the flip side of that, when you bring in a, uh, an industry that it requires a higher level of education, I think the higher level of education will happen. There's a lag time, obviously, but I, I think that's part of the equation here. Um, I, I suspect all of you would agree with me that it's going to become more expensive to educate uh, the children of tomorrow. We're not going to be able to do this with less money. And to get more money, we are either going to have to attract more people into West Virginia, because when we have more people coming into West Virginia, they, they buy or rent uh, residences, and then that adds to the property tax base, which uh, substantially funds public education. So we either have to get more people coming in or we, we have to find other ways to generate revenue because we, we cannot starve our public school system and expect it to perform at a high level. And I think, I think we're just going to have to have more conversation around that topic. We also, um, while we're having conversation around the topic that we can't starve our public school system and expect to have better results, we also have to say, look, here are the things that are working um, in other places in other states, and if it's work, if it works, do more of it, and um, and we can identify those things, and then we just have to set our minds to doing more of it. So, Steve, I realize recruiting the business is a very complex issue, and many many things come into play, but if you were approaching a, a proverbial Procter and Gamble in Ucor, could only make one point, one point. What would be, to, to attract a business, what would that one point be? Um, uh, you, you know, you, <laughs> Bill, we have so much to offer that you've asked a really tough question there. But I think the chief thing that I would say is that we have a workforce that is known for being uh, so loyal, known to be so good to show up for work. Um, that when, um, when West Virginia people outside of West Virginia go looking for jobs, it's, uh, it's well known in the, um, uh, among the companies that you want to hire West Virginia workers because they're going to be loyal um, and they're going to be uh, uh, good employees. So I think the, probably the number one thing I would say is we can give you a workforce. You know, on the flip side of that, we have a lot of company towns here in West Virginia, not necessarily Eastern Panhandle, although the, that is true here to a certain extent, too, 
where the towns themselves are are suffering and falling into great disrepair because the companies around which the towns were built just leave uh, for, for whatever reason. Are, does that provide, and, and I know that I, it's, um, uh, I'm trying to, the, the Weirton facility, I'm, I'm Mm -hmm. Form energy. Form, form energy. energy. Form, form energy. energy came right. In. Yep. Uh, right. Which is kind of making use of existing infrastructure to to speed up the, the the construction of their facilities. Are we seeing more and more of that elsewhere in the state? We are. We're seeing that happen, especially in the Ohio Valley, where the terrain lends itself to um, large development. Um, you know, one of the challenges we face, all states face certain challenges. Um, and just as an example, in Mississippi, parts of Mississippi are doing well, and then you have, say, the Mississippi Delta, which is still a very uh, regionally poor place. Well, you can find a story like that in, in most states. In West Virginia, if we let's say we took six to nine counties out of the statistical mix, our numbers in a lot of areas automatically go up. Our household income numbers go up. Our uh, gross state product numbers go up. Um, our uh, workforce participation rates go up. But here's the thing. We can't, and, and many of those counties are in um, southern or what I guess I would describe as south central um, West Virginia, and um, they traditionally were um, well-to-do mining and timber communities, and the combination of, of course, it began, it's well chronicled, it began in the late 1940s and early 1950s, the mechanization of the mines, the moving the train, you know, a, a good example is the trains going from being uh, coal uh, powered to diesel power. Um, at, at the same time, the mines were being mechanized. And then a substantial downturn in the last um, 10 years or so in coal production because there have been substantial downturns uh, related to uh, permitting and other things that the coal industry needs to survive. And, and those have just taken a toll on many southern West Virginia communities that it could take a very, very long time to figure out how to how to re, um, reconfigure those communities for success. And then pro I think it's realistic to say it's going to be a struggle in a number of places. When you have, you know, we have a county in southern West Virginia that had a population of over 100,000 in 1960, and today probably has less than 17,000. Mm. And, and nobody's going to turn that around very quickly. Uh, Steve, a kind of a political question. Uh, minimum wage has become a major issue in several states. Uh, do you think we need to have to increase the minimum wage in West Virginia, or should that be strictly market-driven? market, market driven? Well, we probably have a, a bias within the Chamber of Commerce of uh, weighing carefully uh, what the market will bear. And uh, we want to see everybody have an opportunity to earn more and to move above minimum wage. West Virginia has set its minimum wage above the federal average. And um, uh, we, we were a little bit concerned about that at the time, just for fear that companies would lay people off. But um, what we've experienced, uh, we didn't oppose it. We just had some concerns about it. But what we've experienced, Bill, is that very, very few employers are paying minimum wage because they need to pay more than minimum wage to get the workforce that they need. Um, I was talking last week with an important employer in, a, in one of West Virginia's very small counties, and he told me that his starting wage is $15 an hour. He said, number one, I, I want people to, to who work in my place of business to to make that much, and and secondly, I need to pay that because I need to get uh, quality workers who will stay with me, and um, so I, and I experience that as I go around and talk to various people in our communities. Um, minimum wage is largely paid to people who are entering the workforce for the first time and need to be trained to do a job, and so. Um, 
Um, we're not hearing, uh, we certainly want people to make the very best living they can make. After all, that helps everybody. That money comes right back into the economy. Um, it, um, it gets spent, and that boosts the economy. Um, but we're not hearing any, um, any substantive talk about moving the minimum wage at this time. I don't know anybody who's making, I think the West Virginia minimum wage is eight seventy five an hour, and I don't know anybody, maybe 16-year-olds are, I don't know, yeah. who's, who has made that in a couple years. COVID yeah, kind of I blew the minimum wage talk out of the water, and, and I remember when $15 was the push, Steve, and COVID yeah. blew through that for a while. Yep. We were hiring, yep. I mean, you couldn't find someone who could get anybody to work for them for less than 18 or 20 an hour for a while. Yep, yep. Yeah, certainly in our region, uh, you know, we see signs up even at, at fast food for 15 and $18 an hour jobs. Yeah, so. I, I haven't seen that in a while. Uh, Steve, uh, Mitch Carmichael's his office, of course, has the, on the point, uh, point of the spear for a lot of this. Uh, I know that you work very closely with uh, Mitch office. Do you have a formal arrangement uh, of working relationship trying to recruit new businesses, or is it just mutual support? You know, it's uh, mutual support so describes it very well. It's a, sort of a handshake relationship. Uh, Mitch Carmichael, Mike Graney, um, are extremely responsive. Uh, Steve Spence, uh, people in the development office. Uh, we've we've got a a really fine development office in West Virginia. I would say it's probably not big enough. It probably needs um, more um, uh, reach, more ability to have site ready um, uh, locations to put companies on, but. Um, we are certainly blessed by having good leadership. Now we need to, you know, it, it doesn't do any good to have a, a real good general if you don't give the general a, a good army behind him. Um, or, uh, Bill, maybe I should change that to, to a, a Navy <laughs> metaphor. But uh, Admiral. <laughs> um, um, that's right. Yeah. Um, but uh, we, we, so we got to give them, we've, um, we, we've got great leadership at the top. We've got to give them what they need to do their job. The the drumbeat from Washington, <clears throat> certainly for the last ten years, um, fairly consistently, has been moving, trying to move the United States away from fossil fuels. And we can talk about the the folly of that. That's not really what we're, I don't want to discuss the, the ins and outs of whether that's a good idea. But I'm kind of sensing there's a certain inevitability of of all of this over the course of the next 20 or 30 years are as by doubling and tripling down on on the fossil fuel industry in West Virginia which I is probably a necessary thing to do are we whistling past the graveyard of of for the future 20 or 30 years from now if if we don't find a way to shift away from our dependence on fuel production? Are, are we just looking at a long slog into ugly things? You know, um, I think the energy picture, the energy scene in 20 to 30 years is likely to be very different than what we have now. Um, and you have to ask yourself, as coal-fired power plants age out, is anybody going to invest in new ones? And right now the answer to that apparently is no. Um, no one is going to invest in new ones. But we've, see, we've also seen um, geo, uh, uh, geo global politics change the energy scene very dramatically, very quickly. That happened in the 1970s when um, the uh, Arab oil embargo caused us to uh, actually double down on uh, building coal-fired power plants. The problem is those plants are now aging out, and the political um, tenor in the country and to some extent in the world is opposed to coal. Um, but as things happen in Europe and natural gas pipelines, supply lines get cut from Russia and so forth, some of those countries wish they had more coal production. China is still moving toward electricity production with coal at a very rapid rate. So um, 
you know, our view here at the West Virginia Chamber is we have to meet the current needs, we have to meet the anticipated needs of the next several years, but we also have to look at diversifying our economy. The energy, when you have an energy economy, you always have a cyclical economy. I mean, that's true in any large energy producing state, whether it's Alaska or Louisiana or West Virginia. And um, so we need to even out, we need to smooth out the cycles in the economy by having other forms of, um, of employment and, and good employment for people. And what we think here at the West Virginia Chamber is that in our state, we, we sort of overlooked manufacturing as being important in that mix for many, many uh, years, for many decades. And uh, you, you, we've talked about this figure before, but um, if you go back to 1980, West Virginia had approximately, and I'm rounding here a little bit, but West Virginia had approximately 130,000 manufacturing jobs. Today, we have approximately 46,000 manufacturing jobs. So one of the real stories in our state is that we, uh, we let our manufacturing se sector slip away from us. And... Um, We've corrected some of the problems that we had related to manufacturing, but we haven't corrected all of the problems that we had. And if we don't take that seriously, we won't be able to have see our manufacturing sector grow. That's all right, a, Steve. Bill, we're out of time with sure. Steve. Just to, to wrap this up, Steve, uh, on the Steve Roberts Christmas uh, wish list under the tree this year, you would like what from the West Virginia legislature? Um, a, a real focus on data-driven uh, decision-making. What does the data say we should do? Let's move away from happy talk and let's look really look at the data and then make data-driven decisions. I like that answer, Steve. Good one. Hey, great to talk with you again, sir. Always good to be with you. Merry Christmas to all, and thank you so much for having me. Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas to you. Yeah. Thank you. So